people from not practicing them. It's just saying that you can get damaged by doing practices that you're not ready to do. As an example, uh, there are tantric yogas that people will practice considered left-handed path in India. And in those practices, they will eat human flesh. Um, they will, there's a particular rite that tantric yogis will do where they'll find the dead body of a 12 year old girl and have sex with it. So they'll have sex with the dead body of a child. Um, they will do drugs. They will go out to, they will, uh, they will smear themselves in blood or they'll sm smear themselves in cremation grounds. And the idea behind this is that if you're able to do these things and stay completely emotionally detached from them, then you have transcended the realm of duality. So now, you know, the concept of life and death and right and wrong and good and bad and existence and non-existence kind of like fade away into some kind of enlightenment. Okay. How many people can do that without being psychologically damaged from the experience? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So like, okay, I get what you're saying about being able to do those things and being detached, but that's not for everybody. And take somebody who's not ready to do those kinds of practices and try to force them to perform them. I, I'm not even, I'm not saying that they're right. I, my, I, like I said, my morality and ethics is different. It's not, I, I, I would never do that. I would never encourage anybody to go do that. I, I wouldn't, that's not, me. that's not my standards of ethics and morality and right and wrong and good and bad, okay? I actually, what I found out after being in these practices long enough, I realized that I'm very vanilla in the spiritual realm. I realized that the practices I do are actually really, really almost harmless compared to some of the shit that other people practice in these realms. So what I'm saying is I'm not gonna go digging up dead bodies and uh, perform necophilia over top of dead bodies in order for me to find enlightenment, in order for me to transcend life and death. I don't need to do that. But if somebody really feels the need to do that, whew, damn, they better be pretty psychologically prepared. Experience. Because I've, been, I've, I've had experiences that I don't think I was ready for that kind of was traumatizing uh, at the moment, but then after being able to integrate the experience was able to recognize the value of it, why something was performed a particular way and why it might be necessary under certain circumstances like animal sacrifice. I used to be a vegan. I have performed animal sacrifice myself. Um, you know, I have, I have slaughtered an animal ritually in order to, in a magical working. Now you might or might not feel some kind of way about that towards me. How you feel about me isn't really my problem. But what I'm saying is, is that I, I, my practices sometimes require or are part of this, the ceremony is to perform an animal sacrifice and the animal is sacrificed as humanely as possible. And the reason why it's slaughtered is because blood is absolutely necessary to do a particular thing, which is to feed the spirit. So. Um, if you are on the fence about whether or not it's right or wrong to sacrifice an animal, do not have anything to do with African traditional religions at all. Sacrifice is actually something that's fundamental to the practices within Palo Mayombe and voodoo and stuff like that. There's ways you can, there's, there's things you can do that are not animals um, to serve your spirits, but there might be a time in which an animal is needed. And if you're not going to do it, then you're going to have to find a priest that has the ability and the know-how to be able to perform that kind, of, that kind of situation. Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is you gotta figure out what it is that you believe before ever going into any kind of practices. Because once you go into those practices, you're not going backwards. There's only one way to go. And that's a forwardly direction, okay? I can't go backwards. That's not an option for me. So I've already attained a certain place spiritually that there is no going backwards, there's only going forwards for me, okay? And once you actually take an animal's life to feed your spirits or to feed your ancestor, uh, you can't not take back that life. You see what I'm saying? And so now uh, I perceive the world differently based on my experience. So if you've never done that, 
or are unwilling to do that, I, I can't explain to you the spiritual benefits or ramifications from uh, being involved in those kinds of practices. Does that make sense? So, I mean, if you've ever ate a Kentucky Fried Chicken, or you've ever gone through the McDonald's drive-through, or you have ever gone to a grocery store and bought yourself a steak, <laughs> and came home and sat down and ate that steak without saying a prayer over it, thanking God for the ability to have food, then, you know, then you're kind of a hypocrite if you look at me for feeding my ancestors and giving them a chicken or a pigeon, okay? Like I haven't gone out and slaughtered goats and pigs, but I'm saying like a pigeon or a chicken is different, you know? But when you go to the grocery store and you see all of those, uh, you see hundreds of chicken breasts sitting on, um, you know, the rack, Every single one of those chicken breasts was a chicken that had to get killed in order for you to eat it. But so we're so, we're so separated, we're so separated from like nature that we have forgotten that nature has a cycle of life and death and rebirth. And in order for something to live, something has to die. But we don't, we don't see that, you know, when we eat our food, everything comes in a package. And we forget that there is suffering that an animal has to go through in order for us to eat. So there's a disconnection between seeing a living animal, slaughtering that animal, cooking that animal, and eating that animal. Because I guarantee you, if people had to kill the animal or slaughter the animals that they actually ate, they would eat differently. They would view their food differently. They would have more respect for animals they would probably pray before they eat their meals. So what I'm saying is we've become extremely disconnected from traditional life, which is an agricultural life and life that happens on the farm. You know, if, if you were born and raised on a farm, you probably don't have problems with those kinds of things because you're used to seeing animals being born, raised, um, and used for food or meals or whatever, you know, but, so that's what I'm saying about like certain practices, you either move forward or you don't. And if you don't feel like you can psychologically handle it, like it was difficult for me. I had to overcome that. Being a vegan, I had to overcome that aspect of that harsh aspect of reality when it comes to life and death and the cycle of uh, rebirth. You know what I'm saying? Because, uh, Let me put it this way. If, if I knew that somebody that I loved was going to die, if I did not perform some kind of animal sacrifice in order to get the results that I want, in order to save that person's life or to give them the protection that they needed in order to overcome a certain situation, I'm gonna choose an animal's life over my friend's life every day. I'm going to say, I'm so sorry, Mr. Chicken or Miss Chicken, uh, you're dying for a good cause and that chicken would be gone. If I knew that using, casting some kind of spell that used an animal's blood in order to do it was going to help somebody, then I'm going to choose a human life over an animal's life every day. But you might not feel that way. You might stand there and stare at a chicken and put more value on a chicken's life than your kid. Okay, there's your choice. That's a choice. So, <laughs> oh, like I said, you know, decolonize your mind. You know, if you're going to practice magic and witchcraft, you need to understand it. And people who don't get that this stuff is real get into the middle of a situation and then they realize this shit is really real, that this is not Harry Potter. This is not, uh, you know, Sabrina, the teenage witch, this shit's real. And then reality hits and then you're in the middle of some kind of crisis, you know, and then you have some kind of issue about it. You know, I, when I got initiated in voodoo, I knew that am animals were going to be sacrificed during the ceremony, during my initiation process. And I had accepted that the initiation process was going to require some kind of sacrifice in order to do the ceremony, in order to uh, serve the spirit. And I did it. And it, was, and it was something that I walked into knowing that every single one of my ancestors that practiced this religion did this before me back 10,000 years. So 
I, tr I went into a traditional religion because it connected me and plugged me into um, a particular bloodline and a particular path and a particular religion that's been practiced for a very long time in a very particular way. And I decided that I was going to go down the traditional path and I was going to abandon other paths because uh, that was the path that I wanted to go down. But I, but you know, I've been sick. There was someone threw witchcraft at me, someone really, really powerful threw witchcraft at me a couple of years ago, two years ago or so. And um, it hit me hard and I was sick. It made me really, really sick. They were coming after me hardcore. I told my godfather, I said, I am getting sicker and sicker by the day. He said, you need to come down to Florida and we need to clean you off immediately. So I got on a plane, I went down to Florida and uh, they cleaned me off with chickens and other birds, you know, smeared live animals all over me. And then those animals had to go, you know, there was only one way to get that shit off of me. And that was by being cleaned off and they cleaned me off with animals. And as soon as they, as soon as they did the spell, as soon as they did the ritual, as soon as I was cleaned off, as soon as the animal was sacrificed, whatever it was that was on me was off of me and never came back. And I almost immediately felt well, like within minutes, I felt well. I don't know. I, I can't explain that to you. I, I just can't explain to you how that worked. That's why I said, I don't, I don't know how to make this phone, but I know how to use this phone. And I don't understand how magic in the spiritual world works, but I know that there are practices that you can do that are going to create specific results. And I think it's more important to understand how the results play out. It's so funny because, um, when the spirit came down, the person who cleaned me off with um, the animals was actually possessed by um, a loa when um, they cleaned me off. And when the loa came down and possessed uh, my, my godparent, it was so interesting what he did to me because, um, so as soon as the loa came into possession, the first thing it wanted to do was pray the Apostles' Creed, the Hail Mary, and the Our Father prayer. The first thing they wanted to do was pray. So we said Christian prayers first. Then they removed all jewelry all, um, off of me. Um, I, I got down, I got down to like just my shorts or my pants or whatever. And then it was like time to take the animal and to clean me off. And, uh, you know, they, they put the animal on my body, you know, I wiped my hands off on it, like all kinds of stuff the, he was speaking in Portuguese and he was praying, the spirit was praying while he was doing whatever he was doing to me. Um, you know, they blew rum on me, they blew rum on the bird, they used cigars, they cleaned me off with cigars. Um, and then at a certain point in time, the animal was sacrificed and it was given to the spirit world and the spirit world, you know, just took it right off. It was, it was a spiritual practice. It was a traditional practice of cleansing. And it was a Congo rite. It was things that Africans practiced in the Congo who, syncre who were syncretized between Catholicism and traditional African practices from 500 years ago. So God, what are you supposed to say to that? How, you can, how can I compare that to any other spiritual experience I've ever had? It's crazy. But, you know, like I said, once you have an experience, it's pretty difficult to ignore your spiritual experiences. You know what I'm saying? I just thought it was interesting that when the spirit came into possession or when a lot of spirits in my tradition come into possession in Espiritismo and also in Palo, when they come down, they want to pray and they want to say Catholic prayers. I think it's very interesting. I'm not Catholic. I don't really consider myself Christian. But when the loa comes down and says, we're going to pray, my hands come together and I sit there and I say, you know, say the prayers with them. So that's why I have mad respect for the spiritual world. And I feel like the practices that I've become involved in over the past five years have really taught me a lot about the spiritual world, about the spirit world. Um, and it's, it's that part of spiritism that comes into play um, that 
people who are not raised in a culture that works with spirits don't understand. Like Denise had a, a near-death experience, experienced shamanic sickness, the shaman sickness after her near-death experience where she was sick, had to pull herself together. Um, and now is in a situation where she goes into situations and she works with paranormal activity and spirits. She's actively involved with working with spirits. That's a very different experience than like someone who picks up a book on Wicca and decides that they're the, they're the queen bee, uh, they're, the, they're the supreme because they know how to light a candle. It's very, very different. And you can't compare them because I, I respect everyone, but it's, it's the um, entitlement for me that gets me every time. It's what makes my asshole tighten up. It's what gives me a pain in my rectum when I see these people with that level of entitlement. Um, and then I'm like, well, you come off pretty entitled too, you know? So, I mean, I know that I come up, I can come off entitled, but I'm the first person to tell you, I don't know jack shit about fuck. And besides not knowing jack shit about fuck, you know, I can only give you suggestions. My opinion about shit doesn't matter. Jennifer's opinions don't matter. Nobody's opinions matter because no one gets to live your life and no one gets to have your spiritual experiences. That's what I've learned. And I've learned at the end of the day that you need to make up your own motherfucking mind about what's right and wrong and how you're going to handle your shit. Because let me tell you something. If you don't handle your shit, your shit will handle you. 100%. <laughs> I'm so glad that you guys hung out with me today. Oh my God, what a day. What a day, what a day. This was very good. I hope that you had fun at least. You probably knew most of this information that I shared, but in case you didn't know, I hope that maybe you learned something or something that I said today will help you in your practice. A process. See, that's how this. That's how my mind works. My 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 brain has like a thought process. I think it's it has to do with like maybe my <laughs> autism spectrum disorder or whatever they say, whatever spectrum I'm on. My spectrum brain makes me process information like that. Those are all the stages that I have to go through before I will light a candle. It's exhausting. So, do you guys have any other questions or? Any concerns or anything I can help you out with? Can I ask you about when you were talking about the serpents earlier? Yeah. So I had, um, I went through a crossing the veil ceremony type thing or whatever with Poverly. And um, she took us through that meditation where you you're relaxing your feet all the way up blah, blah 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 and so I ended up going into the earth into like this cave and I had like this sun symbol with like two sickles around it but then what came out was out of one of the tunnels was a red dragon feminine and she took me like I I'm on her back, whatever. And she took me and I call it the cosmos. I don't know what else to explain it as, but um, very relaxing, very peaceful, very, very loving experience. And I just, and I can still, I can still connect with her like now. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. Though. I don't <laughs> 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 but she's there like i can call upon her any time and she's right there and she, you know it's almost like she's loving like a like a like a dog is you know what i mean like comes and nudges and and just very loving you know but it's and she you know i think her name is maya like that's what i hear when i when i ask is i hear maya and she's red and has these beautiful golden eyes and i mean i can see her pitch perfectly you know but it's like i don't know what the purpose is and what I'm supposed to be asking of her or doing with her or giving to, I don't know. Have you ask her, does she communicate telepathically? Does she speak at all or does she just appear and you write her? She doesn't speak to me. We either just spend time together or like, I don't know if I should be asking her questions. Like I just, I guess I don't know what her 
what my role with her, her role with me is, or should I ask her should, and should I listen to what, what, like, that's what I don't know. Should I use the divination to ask her questions or should I just ask her and telepathically listen? Cause that, that's how, it, that's how I got her name. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you, do you feel the need for the relationship to improve or are you happy with where it's at? Oh, she's very comforting. <laughs> Good. You know, it's just, she's just very comforting having around, but it's almost like she is showing me the universe, like mm -hmm. showing me the cosmos and showing me the stars and the like we go through like wormholes, you know, and it's very enjoyable. So I don't know if it's just to, to show me the other realms that, that are present. Like, I feel like that's almost the purpose that she takes me to the other areas. And you just answered all your questions for yourself. Okay. Because there are certain, no, I'm serious. And I'm not being flippant with you and I'm not no. trying to avoid your question. What I'm saying is, is that uh, for whatever reason, whatever spirit or entity comes to us to work with us, you should always feel comfortable. You should always feel good. You should always feel relaxed and you should never feel like, you know, in, in any kind of bad way when you're working with a guide, it sounds like that's one of your spirit guides. It might be that your spirit guide is specifically manifesting itself for you in that way because it's the way that you can process it or because they know that's what you would like or what you will find acceptable to work with them. And I would say when you spend your time with Maya, that spend your time and just wait, like be more perceptive, just be more quiet, be more still internally. And you might actually feel that you're getting more intuitive knowledge coming through telepathically if you just are more quiet, more still, um, because sometimes our own thoughts or even doubts or perceptions will fuck with the message if we judge it too hard, unless we allow the experience just to be the experience. It's like a dream. Like you can go to sleep tonight and you might have a massive dream and you might wake up and you'd be like, I remember that dream. It was crazy. I was talking to these people. I only remember half the conversation, but it was very comforting. And now I feel like I have an answer to a question. Like I actually had a dream the other night. I went to sleep and I was feeling troubled. I was feeling pressed about a particular issue. And um, in my dream, I actually ended up sitting in like an old house with two black women. One of the women was um, about 50 years old, between the ages of 50, maybe 45 and 55. And the second woman was between the ages of like 55 and 65. And both of them were very kind, very pleasant. I remember exactly what their faces looked like. And I was asking them questions about the Orishas. I was asking them questions about Orisha and they were answering my questions, okay? And I had very specific questions I wanted to ask. And they actually, the, when I remember, I remember waking up to having the answer, the question, the answer to the question that was most pressing for me. Do I feel better after the dream? Absolutely. I feel 100% better after having that dream. Now, does that dream actually mean anything in the real world? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. Thank I you. Have a, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm jealous. I want a dragon. <laughs> I, I, she I have a... I have a brujo. I have, I have this guy who's around me all the time. I call him brujo. He's, he's the other brujo. He's got dark hair. He looks like he's about between the ages of like 18 and 25. He's thin. He wears like a black shirt. He wears a lot of jewelry. He wears a pair of jeans. He's always barefoot. He never smiles. Very, very, very emo. And he'll just will come in and he'll just like lay down on the ground or flop himself down on the couch or just kind of like sit down somewhere, you know, and recline. He's completely, I, I don't know if he's useful or not useful. I don't know why he's here uh, other than he's one of my spirit guides, but he's not active. He never gives me messages. He never talks to me, but he's there. Does he bother me? No. Am I happy when he comes around? Absolutely, yes. 
you know, I feel like I'm not alone. I feel like I'm in the room with someone that I know very well that we don't have to talk to be in the same room with one another. Have you ever been in a relationship? You've got a friend or a partner or somebody you can sit in the same room and you can just sit around and not do anything, but you feel comfortable with that person. That's how I feel about this other brujo that comes around. But do I ask him to do anything? No, not really. So all of our, our guides do different things, I think, depending on, I, I know this sounds crazy and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but this is what we believe in my tradition. It's that these spirits that we work with, they have perimeters. They have parameters, parameters to work around. They're divinely appointed by God and they're only allowed to say so much. You know, they're only allowed to do so much and say so much. I, I really think that there are certain boundaries that have to do with free will that they don't cross. And I don't understand the rules of the game. So like you might ask your spirits a question and they might say yes, or they might say no. Then you might try to get clarification on that question and then they fall silent. And then they give you the runaround. Now they're giving you the maybe over and over and over again, or kind of, or eh, not really. And you're like, well, what kind of answer is that? Maybe they're not allowed to say. All I know is that the spiritual world uh, can see things that we cannot see and they can see into the future, okay? Spirits told me shit about two years ago that came true like two years later. No joke. Um, so don't be freaked out when your spirit tells you something and then like a year later or six months later or two years later, that exact same thing happens. Then you will know. Then you will know, fuck, that thing that they told me that was completely random that I didn't understand, that shit happened. That's when you, that's when you feel like you want to shit yourself or piss on yourself when you realize that they told you something and then it came true and that they saw that thing or they knew that thing was going to happen a couple of years in advance. It makes you afraid because then you're thinking to yourself, well, what else do they know? Like, well, what's going to happen two years from now? Well, fuck, they already know. Do you see what I'm saying? It gets really, you can really go down a crazy rabbit hole in your brain if you allow yourself to ruminate and, and think about these things too hard. Okay, that's why I just say I'm here for it. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens. I'm just, I'm, I'm embodied. My consciousness is here. I'm here. I'm in this world. I'm not in some other world. I still have to get up every day. I still have to do massages. I still have to do readings. I still attend to my altars. I still say my prayers. I still do yoga. You know, I still work on my diet, whatever, yada, yada, yada. But whatever happens, happens. Like I have no, I feel like I have, I feel like I have control. But then at the same time, I'm like, well, at the end of the day, I have zero control. And if you could just like say, okay, I don't have control over anything and I'm going to be okay with it. I don't have to be in control of everything. I am not God. That's what they teach you in AA. That's what they teach you in Alcoholics Anonymous. The only thing you need to know about God is it's not you. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what the hell is going on. I don't know how all this stuff is going to play out. But I, and I, and, and to a certain extent, I stopped asking them questions because I'm like, if I don't really want, if I don't want to know the answer really, then I'm not going to ask. And they're never wrong, ever. But you have to be really connected to your spirits. And the only way to become more connected to your spirits is continue to engage with them, talk to them. I talk to myself all the time. I, I talk out loud a lot, which is probably why they know me so well. You know, your spirits know you. They're around you all the time. They probably know what you're going to do before you even know it. They can guess what you're going to do. Because if they see you wake up every single morning at 8 a.m., they probably are like, you know what? This person's going to wake up every morning at eight. You know, so, or they know what you like to eat. They like, they know what you don't like to eat. You know, they, if you, if you really believe in a guardian angel or a primary spirit guardian, or you really, really believe in spirit guides, then you have to recognize that you don't have to tell them anything. You don't have to explain anything to them because they already know. It's almost like 
paradoxical. It's like, well, I wanna to talk to my spirit guides, but what am I gonna say? What can I tell them that's new? Well, you know what I do? I tell them how I'm feeling. Tell them how I feel. I say, I'm mad or I'm sad or today I feel okay. Today we're gonna to have a good day. Today we're not gonna let anything bother us. You know, I don't know what to say. I'm just as clueless as everybody else, you know? And I do a workshop like this and by the end of the workshop, I'm like, I don't know shit. <laughs> like I said all this stuff for the past five hours, but at the end of the day, those are just things. And like I told you from the get-go of this workshop, I can only tell you the things that I experience and maybe something I experience helps you. But um, besides, you know, that I have no ability to anything. Denise, is that an Annabelle doll? Right there. Do you see, do you see the doll? Oh, I have to unmute her. Denise, that's scary. She's into that kind of creepy shit. I can't do the creepy shit. Oh, do you guys want to see some of my, my people? They don't mind. This is a spiritual temple. Oi. Oh my God, I can't walk. Oh. I've been so inactive for a while. And then when I come to Brattleboro to where my office is, I have to walk around and it's like hilly. So I'm going up and down the hill and stuff and walking and my legs feel like they're going to fall off. I feel like I'm going to break a hip when I stand up. Okay. Oh, I had candles burning in here and they've been burning the whole time. I didn't even know. <laughs> That's good to know. Okay. Well, I have a spiritual pot and this spiritual pot is um, a pot that I have to represent my, my egun um, in Palo. And I'll just give you a quick scan of it. First, okay. There. So this is um, some symbols that uh, are very important for me to draw when I practice magic, but this particular pot um, is for my, my morto, the spirit of the dead that I work with. And it's not like they're always in the pot. They're always with me, but that's a place that I like to talk to them. The other thing is here is my little altar shrine for the Virgin, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And this particular um, altar specifically honors the mortos that come from Mesoamerica, including Santissima. Yeah. And then over here, I have not only an ancestor altar, but I also have Oshun moved to um, this room. And then also over here, this is the voodoo altar. This is the altar that um, is a, an altar of a voodoo azan, a sansista, someone who practices sanse, because every single one of those saints represents a particular loa. Then um, over here, actually in the window is my shrine for my friend, Chris, who passed away. His anniversary is coming up on the 29th. That's Chris. And then I have something for the Tainos and the Native American spirits, the ancestor spirits. And then I have my spirit dolls. Oh yeah, and Jazzy, yep. And then I have a place for the seven African powers and also for my Madonna. So that's a quick overview of the virtual room. They get food, they get drink, they get candles, they get incense, they get cigars. 
and actually when it comes to animals um the when whenever you do something with an animal at least in my tradition that might happen once a year it might happen during an emergency situation or like maybe once a year it's not something like i'm not over here chopping chickens heads off every single day or every other day that's it's not really part of my tradition um it's not heavy into all of that but that's that's what's going on over there with my people yeah and you know what's so funny is i went into um working with ancestral spirits and then I thought, well, I'm going to study a little bit more Buddhism, or I'm going to do a little bit more of this, or I'm going to do a little bit more of that, or I'm going to go back and review some Solomonic magic that I was going to do before. I went back and I'm like, none of that feels right to me anymore. It doesn't hit the same way that working with my spirits, working with my people feels like, you know what I'm saying? Um, so once you get into your groove and once you know where you belong, then everything will be very clear. You know, I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out where they are, where they belong or what, what fits with them. And if you're able to get to that place, like some of us here are at that place where you know who you are, you know what you're doing, you know why you're here, you know why you're doing it, you know what's coming around, then you feel a little bit more peace. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. You want to see the books? Let me show you the books that I recommend, and then we'll be all set. Come on, dude, give me a break. The other problem is with me, and I've gotten better about this, but man, I've got a short fuse, and I can't, I can't take it when people are just, it's difficult for me to deal with people. I'm not very compassionate. That's why I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Christian because I can't forgive people and I'm not a Buddhist because I'm not compassionate. Those are two religions that I don't need to be in. <laughs> Trust me, I can. <clears throat> okay. So let's start with I was talking about Solomonic magic today and talking about angels and demons. And I was talk and talking about uh the Solomon tradition. The interesting thing about the ghost, and I brought it up because a lot of people are interested in this now, but you know, it's, <clears throat> they want to do it the easy way or the fast way. And I don't believe in cutting corners. The truth of the matter is the Gosia are the Solomonic keys um, and all of that. The tradition of grimoire tradition and Solomonic magic goes all the way back to Egypt. It goes all the way back to Greece and Rome and theurgy, which is God working, and the conjuring and calling of spirits and demons and stuff that's been going on forever. And the reason we know this is because we actually have translations of grimoires from magicians from the first century that actually practice this kind of magic. And the book that primarily is, is this is the, the actual book that um, has been translated is called the Greek Magical Papyri. The Greek magical papyri in translation, including the demotic spells. So this book is literally a book of spells to perform that someone actually performed, people performed in the first century. Next thing is if you want to understand why and how that magic is practiced, you want to get techniques of Greco-Egyptian magic because Dr. Stephen Skinner 
is the expert on ceremonial magic when it comes to Greco-Egyptian magic. So you want to read the techniques of Greco-Egyptian magic, and then you want to read the actual practice or spells that are in the Greek magical papyri. Go, moving on also with Stephen Skinner, because once I pick an author that is like the best author and scholar on the subject, that's who I use. These are techniques of Solomonic magic. Okay, this discusses the techniques of why Solomonic magicians and sorcerers practice what they do and how. And then the actual working manual would be the Goshia of Dr. Rudd. So those two books go in harmony with one another. Techniques in Solomonic magic, the Goshia of Dr. Rudd. If you want to have an understanding of voodoo, you want to get the book Voodoo Songs. The reason why voodoo songs is important is because voodoo comes from Haiti. It came to Haiti and the Dominican Republic and spread from there, including to Puerto Rico, which is the tradition that I practice of Sanse. And voodoo songs um, will actually not only tell you about like exactly what voodoo is about, but if you wanna understand the loa or you want to understand the mindset of working with the spirit, on the left-hand side of the page, they have the Creole song that's sung, and then they have uh, the English translation. The guys called me to challenge the one possessed. Upon my arrival, oh, the bull grew horns. The criminal bulls want to challenge the magic charm. So they're, the songs that are actually sang in voodoo invoke spirits. And then in the very back, there is an extensive appendix of dictionary of voodoo terms that um, will tell you about, well, everything. So that's very important. And there's also the 21 Division Handbook. The 21 Division Handbook is the handbook that I recommend to people that wanna actually learn how to practice Sansei. Sansei, we'll talk about Sansei in a second, because it's, it's, there are different traditions of voodoo, and um, what I practice is called Sansei, but it's, it all comes from the same place, which is Haiti and also from Benin. The Bhagavad Gita, specifically this particular translation, if you want to learn about meditation, spirituality, and the fundamental teachings of Hinduism, you got to read the Gita. That will tell you everything you need to know about the core components of Hinduism. And then also this book, Meditation, A Journey of Exploration by Swami Tadatamananda, a practical guide with 35 beginning intermediate and advanced techniques in meditation. It's a very, very good book. And what I like about it in the back, uh, he talks about like releasing inner pressure build up during meditation. And in the back, there's like a lot of mantras that he breaks down. And then the last two books is a book everyone should be practicing, which is the Japanese art of Reiki. It will tell you where Reiki actually comes from for real, not a joke. And in this book, it gives you a very concise instructions about how to practice meditation and how to perform uh, Reiki on yourself. I'm not getting to where I wanna to get to. Yeah, it's very, very, very illustrated. You in this book. And the last book is if you have an, any interest at all with tantric anything or Tibetan Buddhism or tantric Buddhism or tantric yoga, then Vajrayana, The Essential Guide to Practice by Traleg um, Kaya Gon. This particular book will teach you everything. And you can just not read any other book about Tibetan Buddhism if you just have an interest to understand what it is and all of the tantras, tantric practices. And I'd have to say that there's only two books that I would recommend that I don't, three books that I would recommend that are not here. One would be the Selected Prayers of Alan Carday. 
that teaches the spiritualist doctrine and the spiritualist prayers. And then the other one would be Work in Dim Roots by um, Medicine Man to Hoodoo Man, if you are interested in understanding or learning about root work and hoodoo. So those are the books that I recommend. Um, among the other hundreds of books that I've read. <laughs> oh my God, I've read so many books. My mind is full of tons of, I, I don't want to say it's useless information, but it's a lot of information. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot. Board. Right. <laughs> um, so, and when you mentioned the, the book on voodoo, uh, since I came late in the workshop, I just wanted to ask if it's true that you have to have uh, African descendancy to work with. Let's talk about that for a second. There's a difference between hoodoo and voodoo. Hoodoo is spelled H-O-O-D-O-O. -O -O. And that is a kind of magic. It is a kind of medicinal herbalism and traditional herbalism that was used to heal African slaves when they were injured to keep them alive. And also the magic that was used to protect them from their colonizers, okay? Hoodoo is a system of magical practices that directly are connected to ancestors. And if you are not black and you have no ancestry that, that goes directly to African slaves that were in uh, America, specifically in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, maybe the northern parts of Florida, and even into Virginia, then that practice is not for you because you have to have the spirits to call on to practice hoodoo. Hoodoo doesn't come from Ireland, doesn't come from anywhere other than Africa. It's an African diasporic practice. So if you're not black, stay the fuck away from hoodoo. It is not your thing. Doesn't mean you can't read about it. Doesn't mean you can't learn about it because you know I want to learn and read about everything everybody does because I want to know what everybody does. I want to know whether or not there's a root worker out there working hoodoo against me and how I can protect myself. But I'm not going to practice. I, I'm, I'm not even going to practice hoodoo because I don't have a direct relationship to anyone that practiced hoodoo, okay? The African slaves that are in my DNA and bloodline were in the Caribbean. And those people practiced voodoo. And voodoo is spelled V-U-D-U or V-O-O-D-O-O -O -O or V-O-D-O-U. And in Benin in Africa, it's Vodun, V-O-D-U-N. And voodoo can be practiced by anyone who's initiated in it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, doesn't matter your ethnicity. Voodoo is a religion. The difference between hoodoo and voodoo is that hoodoo calls on ancestors and voodoo calls on deities. There are gods and goddesses and deities that are honored and served in voodoo. Ancestors are too, but the voodoo spirits at least the Radha spirits are spirits that came over from Africa to the new world. You have to be initiated in it. There are spirits in voodoo and Loa that you can call on and you can approach that are cool in nature that are going to be um, cool, easy to work with um, and will, will work with you. But if you're gonna work with the entire voodoo pantheon, you absolutely have to have someone guide you or you need to have an initiation because there are spirits in voodoo that um, are extremely dangerous and can only be called under circum certain circumstances by someone who's trained and someone who knows how to communicate with these particular entities. You're working with spirits. All of this stuff is working with spirits. So once again, um, you f as far as ancestors are concerned and ancestral practices, if you don't have the ancestors to call on that below, that own govern over a particular spiritual practice or discipline, it's not gonna work for you because they're not gonna come. Uh, that's the first thing. If you try to call on other people's ancestors, they won't show up because they're not yours. 
So it doesn't matter if you practice hoodoo or not, it's not going to work because it's not your practice. It's not what your people practiced. And finally, voodoo is initiation based and it's very important to be introduced and have a license to be able to call the spirits of voodoo. It's like getting a driver's license. It's like showing up at a party and then requiring an ID and you not having an ID. If you try to practice voodoo without actually going through a ceremony or getting initiated and being connected with those spirits. So yeah, anyone can practice voodoo, but any kind of diasporic tradition, any African based religion or any um, Native American or indigenous practice, those are things that you have to be very careful of and you have to be guided by people that actually practice this stuff. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I know people don't like that. I know there's a lot of people that don't like it when I say that because white people, they want to do whatever they want. They want to go out. They want to take whatever they want from another culture. They want to use it. They don't want to ask permission and they don't want to say they're sorry about it. Like white people are the worst for uh, spiritually colonizing the world. There are some white girl out there buying a book written by a white woman on shamanism, decides she's going to put a feather in her hair, buy a drum and burn white sage and start dancing in a circle and start doing like Native American songs. Like how stupid can you be? Like how can you not see how disrespectful that is to an entire population of people and all of the spirits of the dead that practice that tradition? To like wanna do something and not even try to contact somebody who knows what they're doing. I, I just don't, I just don't, I don't get it. Reiki is another one. Reiki like traditional Reiki, Japanese Reiki, that was the original Reiki that was practiced before all of these other Reikis requires an initiation and attunement. You have to find a Reiki master that's attuned in this particular Reiki and receive an attunement from them in order to receive the spirits of that tradition because Reiki also works with spirits. Reiki comes from Buddhism. Buddhism is where Reiki comes from, and it comes from a very particular closed practice of Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism, called Shingon and Tendai Buddhism. The guy, uh, 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 Master Yusui, who was the man that brought his Reiki to the world, he was a Tendai Buddhist lay monk, because Tendai Buddhists can get married, and they're like kind of lay practitioners. They are both, um, they're Buddhists, but they also get married. So he had a life, but he was also a, 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 he was a Buddhist priest. And Reiki is a kind of empowerment. When you get initiated in Reiki or you get an attunement, that's also the equivalent of a Buddhist empowerment that's done in tantric Buddhist rituals that prepares the body for being able to practice these things. But no, we're just going to do whatever we want. Um, and... But the thing is, there's things that you can do to honor certain spirits, like Papa Legba or Legba or Legwa or Legba, okay, because he's, he's known by many, many names and he's not just one spirit. We're talking about an entire class of spirits. Another thing that people don't understand about voodoo is that our, a lot of African practices is when we use the word Legba, when we're referring to our Legba, Legba is not one deity, like Zeus is a deity or like um, Apollo is the, the god of the sun. You know, Legba isn't, that's, Legba is a primordial force and energy and is also a legion of spirits, an entire class of spirits. So unless you have that understanding, unless you have the comprehension of what you're working with, then it's impossible to work with anything. And like I said, these practices are very personal. When you go to a Babalao who is a priest in Ifa, he will sit down with the divining chain and the kola nuts and he will cast Ifa for, for you and he will go petition the spirits and he will tell you the Alegba that you have or he will tell you the Alegwa that you have because every Alegwa has different paths. There's 20, Alegwa has 21 paths. Um, Anaisa Paye has 21 paths. So you have an Alegwa, but you need to know which one of those 21 Alegwas you have. So there are, there's, there's very specific things that have to be done within the tradition in order to get, to be able to move anywhere with it. And if you don't have the understanding of it because you didn't read a book or because you didn't talk to someone who actually practiced this stuff, then 
the only thing I can say is if you know someone that practices, then you might ask them to teach you or ask them if you can come along to one of their ceremonies or rituals or learn something from them. Like uh, you might have a practitioner that practices hoodoo and they might say, well, come over to my house, you know, and you teach me some witchcraft and I'll teach you a little hoodoo. And they might tell you something you can do, like make a spiritual bath for yourself or how to make a particular powder or how to light a candle or how to read divination from some kind of way that they might say, yeah, you can do that. I'm giving you permission to. Well, you need to have the license to or the permission from someone who does these practices in order to be able to say, okay, I'm going to do this. So if Mama Sunfire told me that I need to make the spiritual bath for myself and I said, well, you know, is it okay that I do that? And she says, yes, I'm giving you permission to do it. Well, I had a hoodoo priestess. I had Mama, Mama Sunfire is like a hoodoo woman for me. I love her. And so if she tells me I can do something, then I'm, then I'm doing it because I have her blessing because I have someone who told me that I could do it. You know, if I ask Mama Sunfire, hey, can I do this, 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 or that? And she was like, no, don't touch that. That's not for you. Then I would say, okay. But I'm not going to get into fights and arguments with people about what is and what is not a closed practice. Um, because you should know. Those are things that you, you just, you figure out. Um, <clears throat> closed practices are closed either because you need to have the genetic and ethnic inheritance to be able to do it or because you need the initiation. As an example, you're not a Jew if you convert to Judaism. The only people who are Jews are Jewish people. You have, it's an ethnicity, like it's an entire cultural heritage and it's because you are Jewish. You might say, well, I believe in Judaism. That's great, but you're never gonna be a Jew even if you convert because you are not one. In Zoroastrianism, they won't even let you convert to the religion. Zoroastrians are a Persian religion that come from antiquity back all the way back almost to the time of when the Vedas were written. That's an ancient religion. And in order to be a Zoroastrian, you have to be born into a Zoroastrian family and your father and your mother have to be Zoroastrian. If your father's Zoroastrian and he marries someone who's not Zoroastrian ethnically, the child is not Zoroastrian. It's a pure blood religion. You're Zoroastrian because your mother and your father are Zoroastrian and they do not accept converts. So that's an extreme example of a closed practice, both but, uh, ethnically that you can't practice. Um, there are religions like Hinduism that have no founder, have thousands and thousands and thousands, like 10,000 scriptural texts that have been translated and mantras and gurus who have taught people how to practice yoga and Buddhism. Buddhism and, and yoga are open because of the fact that it's a religion that's freely practiced by a group of people and there's no rules and regulations and not really, uh, there's so many different sects of yoga practices that you know there's not one uniform thing. So it's kind of difficult to appropriate yoga because the reason the Bhagavad Gita was written is as a manual for people to meditate. That's the intention of the Bhagavad Gita for people to read it and to be able to meditate and learn how to meditate. It's very, very different from a diasporic practice that was born under slavery, under uh, literally hellish conditions, forged in the fires of hell of the Caribbean with people trying struggling for their lives. So there's a, there's a big difference between learning Hinduism and studying Hinduism and maybe even performing Sanskrit mantras and then trying to perform some kind of specific practices that are related to African diaspora traditions because they didn't experience the same level of persecution. So you have to have respect for that. Um, and then like Catholicism, Catholicism is an initiation based religion, just like voodoo. You can't wake up one morning and say, well, I'm Catholic. I mean, you can, but no one who's really Catholic is going to acknowledge you as a Catholic unless you have been initiated into the Catholic Church, unless you are a confirmed Catholic. You have to be a confirmed Catholic in order to be considered Catholic. You can't just think you're Catholic or feel like you're Catholic or decide that now I'm Catholic because I want to be Catholic. It doesn't work that way. If you, and you can't try to be a priest in, this, in, in a religion that you're not a priest in. 
It's like waking up one morning and going down to the Catholic church on Sunday and telling everybody today, I'm going to perform the Eucharist for you. They'll all laugh in your fucking face because there's a priesthood that's responsible for performing the Eucharist. And in Ifa, in Voodoo, in Palo Mayombe, and other religions that come out of the Caribbean, there are priests that are initiated in an unbroken line of priests that go back 10,000 years. The pot that I was scratched over in Palo Mayombe was, was 250 years old. The pot that I was initiated is 250 years old. There's 250 years worth of empowerments that have gone into that pot. So, I mean, I wasn't scratched over somebody's little dinky pot that they put some dirt in and sacrificed a chicken over. No, I was scratched over a pot in Palo that's 250 years old and that was passed between uh, one Palero who created it another Palero that received it from his godfather and my godmother that received it from her godfather. That's a 250 year old pot. So I didn't get scratched over somebody's dinky little pot with some dirt in it and uh, uh, some animal remains, okay? <laughs> so there's things that you fuck with and things that you don't fuck with. But um, voodoo is open to anyone to learn to study and to approach a priest in order to find out if you can practice it, but then it will require an empowerment or an initiation or a way to connect you with the spirits or formally introduce you to the spirits so that they can work with you. Um, why would a spirit want to work with you if you're non-committal? Why would any spirit want to come around and work with you if you, if you don't have the balls to actually go and get initiated in it? Like, why are you calling me? You're not initiated. And that's the thing about Palo. If somebody went out and bought a, the book on Palo and opened it up and started trying to call Zarabanda or tried to call Mama Shola or started trying to call, um, you know, Siete Rayos, and maybe they, they did it well enough so that they actually got the spirit's attention, the spirit's going to be like, why did you call me? You're not initiated. Who are you? The reason why they scratch you over that pot is because when my blood went into that pot, the spirits of Apollo and I bonded with one another. That means that those spirits know me, they smell me. So when I call on the spirits of Apollo and they show up, they know it's me because I'm bound to them by blood. I made a blood pact, a blood oath with those spirits. I'm bound by blood to the religion of Apollo, because I said, those are my ancestors. Those are the people I want to be connected to. That is why I'm fucking empowered. That is why I'm Brew Orion. That's why I am one. That's why I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. And that's why I'm empowered, because I know what I have. I was scratched and initiated into a religion that was practiced first by the Tainos, and then later by Africans that came from the Congo. And that combination of Congolese shamanism and Taino Native American shamanism is where Palo Mayombe was born from. One of the oldest religions in the new world to be practiced by African slaves. And I got initiated into that because I wanted to be plugged into some real power. I didn't want to, I didn't want to just, you know, like do, do my thing and like be afraid or I, when I go to sleep at night, I go to sleep. I am not afraid of a goddamn thing. I'm not afraid of any sorcerer. I'm not afraid of any magician. I'm not afraid of any witch bitch out there that wants to threaten me. They can try, but they are not going to make me lose one ounce of sleep because of what I have. Do you see what I'm saying? I know that I'm protected because I have, I, because the spirits that I work with protect me. So I'm sorry. There, there are just, there are just things that you can't bypass. You either want to do it or you don't. You either shit or get off the pot. You either grow the balls to be able to like handle the situation or you don't do it. Like there's no, there's no if or but or maybe or wishy-washy or I'm kind of into it. I'm kind of not in this shit. There's like you're either here for it and you're here for it 100% or you're not. And I think that there's a lot of people that are not. They're just not, they're just not here for it. Or they get their faith tested and in some kind of way they get discouraged and then they like turn around and they run back in the opposite direction. Do you know how much I've been attacked for being in the tradition that I'm in? 
if you've been around long enough, at least for the past couple of years or followed me from the beginning on TikTok, you know the bullshit that I've gone through being me practicing these traditions. Has it deterred me from practicing my traditions? No, it's only made me stronger. It's only made me more dedicated. It's only given me more faith because my initiation didn't just come from getting scratched. My initiation came from being persecuted. So I feel like I received a double initiation. One initiation when I made my commitment to the spiritual world and the second initiation by constantly enduring bullshit by ignorant and arrogant people that don't even understand the practices. I'm sorry, I just totally went off into a whole, I just went off into a whole um, rabbit hole there. That was a Brujo Ryan rabbit hole. Um, but you guys see where I'm coming from. How would a spiritual session with me go? Well, what I do is first I talk to you and find out, um, you know, where you're at, like obviously how long you've been practicing, what you've been practicing, whether or not you've had an ancestry DNA test, whether or not you've done any ancestor work, whether or not you have an ancestor altar, whether or not you've ever gotten a reading by a spiritualist that tried to pull spirits to find out who's around you or in your spiritual court. And then what I do is I perform divination. I open up to channeling as a psychic medium to see what I see. And I also use the cards in order to give me guidance. And it's from that information that I pull and I tell you what I see as a spiritualist. I can't, I, I wouldn't be able to initiate you into a, um, I am not a priest in any of the traditions that I practice. I'm an initiate. That means I'm a devotee. I'm a follower, but I'm not a priest. Could not initiate you in Santeria. Could not initiate you in Ifa. Could not initiate you in Palo Mayombe. And I couldn't initiate you in Haitian voodoo, okay? Because the voodoo that I practice is a family tradition and it's a spiritualist tradition. So I can actually do a, a voodoo baptism on you but and do a lave tet, which is what a head rogation, it's a cleaning of the head. Um, and I can tell you what loa are with you or want to work with you, but I'm but I am not a priest that will initiate you into certain traditions. And the other thing is that um uh at all of these religions, they have different branches. There's different branches. There's Palo Mayombe, Palo Monte, Palo Cambisa, Palo Bramba. There is a uh, Haitian voodoo, Dominican voodoo, Puerto Rican voodoo. There's Creolized spiritism. There's Kardec, uh, Kardec spiritism. There's Ifa. There's Lakumi and everything in between. So like it's, it's lots of different branches. It's not just one thing. It's many things. It's many different things. My goal is to try to help you connect with what I think you should be connecting with. Like if you come to me and I do divination, um, I'm going to see what I, what spirits are like more, most likely to respond if you reach out to them, because they're the ones that step forward in my reading. Does that make sense? So if I tell you, I see this woman with you, that's a, like Madama, or I see this shamanic person that's around you, or I see a priest around you, or I might even see like a Buddhist or an Asian person, or I might see animals. I might see a spirit animal around you. I might see serpent spirits. I might see all kinds of things, whatever comes around or any dead grandparents or, or ancestors, I'm going to tell you what I see. Then it's up to you to go back and try to communicate with those people. It's up to you to go back and try to set up your altar so that you can try to pull them, you know, in dream yoga or in, in lucid dreaming. So um, that's what I do. I only point people in a direction, but I learned really, really fucking fast that I did not want to have godchildren and I did not want to be anyone's godparent. I assist people in like um, spiritual coaching sessions, but I'm not going to be anyone's godfather. I, I, I went to be someone's godfather, godmother one time by two people and they turned on me and turned into dogs. They tried to rip me apart after and I was done. Like I'm never doing anything for anyone again. I have performed a, a, a baptism in Sanse in Puerto Rican voodoo on one person. And, I, and I've also initiated, I've initiated two people into Reiki because I am a Reiki master. 
isn't that funny? I practice Reiki and I also practice Palo Mayombe that you couldn't get, you couldn't get farther away from one another um, as far as an intention is concerned. But what's funny is different magic contains different vibration, different vibrations. Okay. So like Palo Mayombe is very, very close to the earth. It's very, very in touch with the natural world. It's very animistic. It is very connected with earth and nature and spirits of the dead. And it's very, very heavy. Like when you walk into a back room or a basement of someone who has pots, you know, consecrated pots in Palo, uh, there's just, a, a, it's just like, it's like walking into a cave, you know? It's like, there's just a dense, musky um, feeling it feels moist, it feels wet, it feels heavy. The environment is heavy, not heavy like in a negative way, but heavy like it's dense. The vibrational energies are dense, they're thick. And then you might go to a Buddhist temple. You walk into the Buddhist temple or you walk into a church that's like um, an Orthodox church and they burn incense and, and you know they have very tall ceilings and there's all kinds of music that is very ethereal. And suddenly you feel like you're slipping out of your body because now you're like starting to move into more of a celestial realm or a higher realm. So there's different, there's different spiritual realms and we interact with them and they all vibrate at different levels. The ones that are the easiest to communicate with are the ones that are closest to us, the, the denser ones. It's more difficult to pull down a higher level spirit than it is a lower level, pull up a lower level spirit. And I don't mean higher or lower in a positive negative way or in like one is better than the other. I mean like pull up literally out of the ground, pull up <laughs> and pull down like literally out of the sky, pull down. That's what I mean. In order to pull a spirit down that's very ethereal, you got to do a lot of work. Oh my God, there's a lot of work that has to go into pulling down a highly elevated spirit. It's very difficult. Um, and that's why when I pray to my, uh, Sanse, I know that they're listening. I know that they're there, even if they don't come down because of the fact that they're so elevated, they're so pure, their spirits are so pure that it's difficult. It, it's difficult for some of them to come down under the right, without being under the right circumstances. So I guess you could say that spiritism and spiritualism is my primary path. That's why I'm much more of a spiritualist than a witch. Even though I know how to practice witchcraft, casting a spell is the last thing I do. Casting a spell is like a last resort for me. It's not the first thing I reach for. The first thing I do when I'm experiencing an issue is I go pray the rosary. <laughs> and I talk to my nun. And then after I talk to my nun, then I start putting out offerings for my ancestors and offerings for the Loa and trying to seek their guidance about what it is I should or should not do. Last thing I want to do is cast a spell. Maybe I'll do a spiritual bath. I will do a spell, a spell candle or a setting of lights where I put out candles and then I do a vigil. But um, the difference between like Palo Mayombe and voodoo opposed to like witchcraft is that I don't do the, I don't do the fighting. The people that do this fighting for me are the spirits. The spirit world protects me. And when I need something done, I go to the spirit world and I make petitions. So we do a lot of petitions and we feed them and we pay them back with offerings. So that is how things are done within my tradition. I don't need to cast a spell as much as I need to go down and make a petition to the spirits, spirit world and see whether or not they're willing to help or not. You know? Did I freak you guys out with all this stuff that I told you? No? Okay. That's good. All right, y'all. Well, I love you guys to death. And thank you so much for being here with me today. I had such a good time. Thank you so much.
this was a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to have to find a way to edit this video because all of this smack that I talked at the end of the recording has to be cut out. <laughs> if anybody wants to watch it, I don't want to talk about because I, I actually, you know, you guys have stuck around here long enough and you've been here with me long enough. I explained to you my practices. I explained to you my understanding of the spiritual world. I explained to you how magic works. And I explained to you what I'm into and what I practice and how I practice it. And that's a privilege because I don't talk about that stuff. Like how I really practice, nobody on TikTok gets to see that. Nobody on Instagram gets to see that. Nobody on YouTube gets to see that. So these are, even if I show little things on video, it, I'm still never going to reveal like the inner practices and the inner mysteries that actually go into all of this stuff. So I'm glad that you guys were around today. Yes, and oh, here's the thing. If anybody would, if you guys would like to, in the comment section before you leave, and I'll take a screenshot um, or other people can screen shoot the phone. If you would like to put your handle or your username on TikTok, put your TikTok username into the chat section. And then if you guys want to follow each other on TikTok, now you have friends on TikTok or other people that, you know, at least you know you can follow that are into the same thing. Yeah. Feel free to share yourself. Thanks, Grace. That's anybody who wants to be contacted. You don't have to do that if you don't want to be contacted. <clears throat> oh. oh, my goodness gracious. All right, everybody. Peace out. Have a great rest of the day. I'm ending it. Mwah. I hope to hear you from you guys soon. I'll see you. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs> Bye.